Hi there. Welcome to the Achievable Podcast. My name is Brandon. I hope you're having a wonderful day, despite the fact that you're probably knee-deep in material, studying until you're bloodshot in the eyes, forgetting that you had relationships with people, hopefully all to get a job that's going to change your life and set things in motion that will set you up for a great career, all that stuff. Uh, Pretty heavy open for us, but try to keep things light as much as possible because yes, this material that you are studying for the exam that you're preparing for is very difficult. Uh, Let's go ahead and get the intro out of the way. I am Brandon from Basic Wisdom. Once again, I run a company that specializes in helping people pass FINRA and NASAA exams. Specifically, I focus on tutoring. And if you or your company needs any kind of help preparing either yourself or your employees for any of these exams, Go to basicwisdom.net and learn a little bit more about how I might be able to help you. I've also partnered with Achievable. We have put together an amazing product that if you're preparing for the SIE exam, you should certainly check out. It combines my expertise in the way that I teach this material that you need to know for the SIE exam with the amazing smart technology that Achievable brings to the game. If you don't know much about smart software. Essentially, this is a program that analyzes everything you do, every question that you answer right and answer wrong. And right when the system feels like you're about to forget some of that information, it filters it right back to you. It's a very efficient way to learn. And combined together, we have released Achievable, the SIE program. If you're interested, go to achievable.me, check that out. But that's all we need to talk about in the intro. And thank you for sticking around beyond that. Today's topic of conversation on the podcast is essentially what is a bond, which a bond is a debt security. We're going to talk a lot about what this actually is and what it actually means. But as you probably know, this is a big part of almost every FINRA or NASAA exam, especially if we're talking about the SIE, Series 7, even the Series 6. You'll see a lot of this in the Series 65 and 66 as well. So this is an area that you need to be pretty proficient in to do well on these types of exams. And if you feel like you're struggling with this topic, trust me, you are not the only one. Uh, In fact, uh, during my tutoring sessions, this is probably top two, top three things that people reach out to me for help on. It's not just the more advanced stuff. I mean, uh, I get people all the time reach out to me, say, hey, this bond seesaw thing, I have no idea what it is. Can you please break this down for me and help me understand it a little bit more? And uh, while we're not going to talk through the bond seesaw today, we are going to talk about the basics of what a bond is how it's structured, why it exists, all that type of stuff. So I'm going to dive into the fundamentals in hopes of helping you better understand what a bond is. A bond is a very broad term, and usually we're referring to a longer-term version of a debt security. Now, because we use the word debt in there, as you probably have guessed, a bond is a type of loan. Specifically, and usually, a longer-term loan is what we're talking about. If you were to buy a brand new bond from an issuer, and by the way, the term issuer is really another general and vague term, It just is any organization that decides to sell a security to the public. And in the real world, any publicly traded company that you can think of is an issuer. And for this podcast, I'm probably going to refer to Tesla a lot. This is no endorsement of Tesla as a company. I'm not telling you to invest in them. I'm not telling you not to invest in them. But let's at least use them as an example. If you were to buy a brand new bond from Tesla, which is an issuer, you're essentially acting as the bank for Tesla. You're lending money to Tesla. At least to me, that is the most bizarre thing about a bond is that it puts us as people into a position of lending money that we usually are not terribly familiar with. The average person borrows a lot more money than they lend. So think about it. I mean, how many times do you borrow money? If you own a home and have a mortgage, you've borrowed money to buy that home. If you have a car loan, you've borrowed money. If you use a credit card, you're borrowing money. Borrowing money is a staple of being an American, for the better or for the worse. When we're dealing with a bond, yes, we're talking about borrowing money, 
But again, we as the investors are in the position that the bank usually is. We are lending money to an organization in order for them to use that money. And technically, they can use that money for any purpose, but they eventually have to pay that money back to us plus interest. Tesla in the past has issued bonds to build car and battery factories. They borrow lots of money, large amounts of money, usually in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And they do that in order to expand their business. And just like a bank, investors like you and me demand interest for the money that we lend. You might be wondering why Tesla doesn't just go to a bank to borrow money. And the short answer to that is risk. Loans are only beneficial to the lender if the money is actually paid back. If you think about it, if you loan money to a friend and then they, for whatever reason, just don't pay you back, not only is that going to strain and possibly end that relationship with that friend, but you're out that money. Whenever anyone or any organization decides to lend money, we always have to worry about that risk, the risk of never being paid back. And you better believe that banks, which are in the business of lending money, that's something they think about every single time they give a loan to someone or an organization. Companies like Tesla borrow in the hundreds of millions, if not the billions of dollars. These are not small companies doing small things. So if a bank were to loan, let's say a billion dollars to one organization or one company, they're taking on a ton of risk. If that company were to go bankrupt, the bank wouldn't be repaid their, let's say, billion dollars of principal. For some banks, let's say some smaller banks, that might be the end of the bank, period. Got to shut the doors, got to fire all your workers, got to just move on to the next thing. For a larger bank, it's going to present itself as a significant problem. I mean, imagine going to your boss and saying, hey, I created this loan for this company, they seemed great. They're going to make the next greatest and best thing. I loaned them a billion dollars of our money and they, they just declared bankruptcy. We're, we're out a billion dollars. Probably a pretty tough conversation to have. The reason why large issuers like Tesla usually don't go to banks to borrow large amounts of money, it's about risk. If they were to find a bank willing to take on the risk of lending a billion dollars to one company, knowing that if that company goes bankrupt, that billion dollars is gone, the amount of risk that one bank would be taking on would result in a significantly high interest rate. That's the only reason why a bank would take on that much risk is if they feel like they're being compensated enough for that risk. So again, if we have a large company like Tesla going to one bank to borrow a billion dollars, it's probably not going to happen, number one. And number two, if it does, it's probably going to cost a lot in interest in order to get the bank to do that. Maybe there's a better way to do that. Maybe instead of putting all the risk on one bank, we spread the risk across thousands of different investors. Bonds exist to give organizations the opportunity to borrow money from multiple different sources. And by doing that, that reduces the risk for everyone across the board so that we don't just have one entity taking on one large loan. That way we can spread the risk again across multiple, usually thousands of different investors. And investors decide how much risk they take. Many investors buy bonds in smaller amounts, which could be as low as $100 if it's a US government bond or usually $1,000 for other types of bonds. And investors only risk what they invest, which is why bonds are more easily sold to thousands of investors instead of just one or a few banks. Think about it from your standpoint. Would it be easier for you to borrow $100 from one of your friends or $1 from 100 of your friends? One central theme of this podcast today is going to be interest rates. And you can think about interest rates just like you think about them right now, right? If you have a credit card balance, your interest rate is probably near 20%. And that's how much you'll pay in interest if you maintain a balance on your credit card. You know, there's that, there's your interest rate on a mortgage, interest rate on a car loan, et cetera. Bonds also have interest rates. And the interest rate reflects the cost of borrowing money from an investor. And yes, the interest rate on a bond should be much lower than the interest rate that they would receive from, say, one bank or one institution that would be maybe willing to lend them large amount of money and taking on a lot of risk doing that. 
Hopefully that helps you understand why bonds exist in the first place. And again, it's to spread around risk and it's easier to borrow from thousands of different investors rather than just one or a few. So let's transition back to the more fundamental aspects of a bond and how it's actually sold to investors. When a bond is created and sold, it is typically sold at what we call its par value. You want to think of its par value as face value or the principal amount of the loan. As an example, if you borrowed $1,000 from the bank to open a small business, the principal would be $1,000. Same thing with bonds, except we're usually talking about large amounts of money. For instance, Tesla in the past has borrowed money in the billions of dollars, and they might borrow $1.5 billion to build a new battery super factory, and if that's the case, the $1.5 billion would be the principal amount or the par value of the overall loan. The company from there breaks up the big loan into small, usual $1,000 chunks, and those $1,000 chunks are referred to as par value of each individual bond. So let's assume that you buy a $1,000 bond from Tesla and lend them some money to build a new battery factory. You give $1,000 over to Tesla, and in return, they give you a bond. And let's talk a little bit more about the components of that bond. Every bond has an interest rate attached to it that never changes over the life of the bond. The interest rate is expressed as a percentage of par. Now, in plain terms, that actually means that if we have a 5% bond, that means it pays 5% of the par value, which is usually 1,000. So 5% of 1,000 would equate to an annual payment of $50 every single year. Remember, the main reason why you would lend money to anyone or anything would be interest. Why would you lend money if you're not getting paid to lend that money? So if you buy a $1,000, 5% bond, you're getting paid 50 bucks a year every single year. Bonds typically make payments in semi-annual chunks, so usually twice a year. So if you're receiving $50 a year every year from your 5% $1,000 par bond, that means you're receiving two $25 payments every year as long as you hold the bond. Every bond will also have a time frame attached to it, or what we usually refer to as a maturity time. So let's assume that our $1,000, 5% bond from Tesla is a 20-year bond. And effectively, this means that this bond will pay interest twice a year, two $25 payments for 20 years. And then at the very end of that bond, which will be 20 years later, at maturity, the bond will pay one final interest payment and the $1,000 of principal back. Now, the interest rate of a bond typically reflects two things. First, the current market interest rates, and second, the risk of the bond. Now, the issuer needs to create a bond that investors want to purchase. And of course, like we talked about, really the main reason why investors buy bonds is for the interest rate that they receive. If the interest rate is too low, investors won't lend their money, and that's a problem for companies like Tesla. If the interest rate is too high, the issuer ends up paying more than they necessarily need to, and that just is a waste of money. Interest rates change over time. Sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're lower. There are a lot of reasons why interest rates change, and that's going to be a whole other podcast within itself, but all you need to know for right now is that on average, interest rates change in the market but we always assume that there's a going rate of interest at any point in time. For instance, right now, you could probably look up the going rate of interest for the average 20-year bond. Let's say, on average, that the going rate of interest for a 20-year bond right now is 5%. That will be the foundation for deciding what the interest rate of a specific bond will be. Issuers need to take a look in the market and figure out what the going rate of interest is today, and that, again, serves as their foundation. Very similar to if you looked up the 30-year fixed mortgage rate today, if you were anticipating buying a house soon. Well, if the rate of interest today is 5%, then you're probably going to borrow money at a rate of close to 5%. From there, the rate of interest on any given bond is typically determined by the risk of the bond. Things like the length of the loan, the creditworthiness of the issuer, and the characteristics of the bond will ultimately determine the risk of the bond. And the more risk that the bond presents to investors, the higher the interest rate that they're going to demand to buy the bond. The less risk, the lower the interest rate. Deciding the interest rate that a bond comes with is not an easy process. 
And in fact, issuers like Tesla will typically involve the services of an underwriter, also known as an investment bank, to help them with this process of nailing down the perfect interest rate to sell the bond at. Now, Tesla is in the car business, or I guess in the technology business, and it isn't necessarily known as a financial company. They don't have the structure, the expertise necessary to create a marketable bond. So a lot of times, companies like Tesla will hire other companies like Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, Morgan Stanley. Those are all big underwriters that help other companies and organizations sell their securities to the public. So Tesla, for instance, could hire a company like Morgan Stanley to help them structure their bond. Morgan Stanley would help with things like, you know, how long should the bond be? You know, how long should Tesla have to repay the money that they borrow? What features of the bond should be there? What features should not be there? Is it a good time to sell a bond? Do we understand the bond market? Those are all things that companies like Morgan Stanley are paid to provide expertise on. And trust me, they don't get paid a small amount of money. This is a game where hundreds of millions of dollars are sometimes made on single sales of one security. So it's an important service to the issuer, also an expensive service. But ultimately, investment banks, aka underwriters, are the in-between between Tesla and, say, the investing public. And at the end of the day, they're the reason why big companies like Tesla can borrow large amounts of money from the investing public and do that effectively and efficiently. Investors in the bond market ultimately decide if a bond is investment worthy. Therefore, that's another reason why knowing investor expectations or knowing the bond market, why that's so important. If the market believes Tesla is a good credit worthy company that will pay back its loan, the interest rate of the bond could be fairly low, maybe even lower than average. But if the market believes the opposite, Tesla may have to offer their bond at a higher rate of interest. This is a recurring theme throughout finance that you're going to realize if you haven't already realized, but with more risk comes for more potential for return. That's the only reason why you as an investor would potentially decide to take on something that's a little bit more risky because you can make more money off of it. The financial well-being of Tesla is a big factor in determining the risk that an investor takes on by buying a bond from Tesla. Now, Tesla could also entertain the idea of adding several different features to the bond, all of which would influence not only the risk of the bond, but also the interest rate of the bond as well. We're going to talk about several different features in the next few minutes or so, some of which are benefits to investors and some of which are benefits to the issuer. And we want to continually think about this from the perspective of risk. And we'll talk about that a lot as we go through these features. The first feature and probably the most talked about feature on any type of bond bond is a call feature. If you've ever heard of the term callable bond, call feature, call provision, if it involves the word call in there and, and the word bond, then it's all relating to the same thing. A call feature allows an issuer to pay back borrowed funds earlier than expected. For example, let's say Tesla issues that 20-year 5% bond that we were discussing earlier. Over the course of 20 years, Tesla would pay semi-annual interest twice a year, then make a final principal payment to investors at the 20-year mark, also known as the maturity date. Now, it's possible that when Tesla sold the bond, they also sold it with a call feature. And let's say that that bond was callable in 15 years, which means that Tesla could decide to pay back those borrowed funds five years earlier than its actual maturity. If you have ever paid off a loan earlier than expected, for example, let's say that you paid your student loans off five years earlier than you needed to. That would be the equivalent of you calling your student loans. You paid back that money for whatever reason earlier than expected. And that means two things. Number one, you're done making payments. So you don't have to make interest payments anymore. That's a good thing for you. But for the lender, let's say the bank that you borrowed that money from, they're no longer getting interest payments from you. So it's kind of a detriment to the person that was loaning you that money because they may have expected to get five more years of interest payments from you. Well, you pay back the money earlier than expected. That's great in terms of being credit worthy, but again, the lender is missing out on five years of interest. Bonds are typically called for one of two reasons. In our example, with our 20-year Tesla bond callable in 15 years, 
If Tesla has extra money available and simply just doesn't want to pay interest anymore, that's a legitimate reason why an issuer would want to pay off a bond. If you have the money in the bank, why would you continue to pay interest on borrowed funds? Just take that money, pay off the loan, and there, you're done paying interest. Wonderful. The second legitimate reason is refinancing, which may be a term that you're familiar with or not, but let's go through an example to better understand this. Assuming that we have our Tesla 5% bond, if interest rates fell to 2% after 15 years of owning the bond, Tesla would consider refinancing. To do so, what they would do is they would call their 5% bond, meaning pay that money off, get rid of the 5% bond, and then reissue a new bond at the lower rate of 2%. And essentially what's happened there is that they've gotten rid of an older loan where they're paying a higher rate of interest and now replaced it with a new loan with a lower rate of interest. And they were able to do that because the current market interest rate went down since the time the bond was issued. People do this all the time with mortgages. For instance, if you have a 5% mortgage and interest rates drop to 2%, you as a homeowner are going to consider paying off the old mortgage with that 5% interest rate and just taking out a new loan at the 2%, and that might save you thousands of dollars over the course of 5, 10, 15 years, however long the time period is. It's a lot of money that you can save as a homeowner. Now, these issuers that refinance, they can sometimes save millions of dollars especially if we're talking about a bond that's in the hundreds of millions or even in the billions. Just do the math in your head. If it's a $100 million loan that's outstanding, a 5% interest rate means the issuer is paying $5 million a year in interest versus a 2% interest rate means $2 million a year in interest. If that was the case with a $100 million bond, that's savings of $3 million a year, which is absolutely something that companies should consider doing if they can do it. So it should be pretty obvious that callable bonds are advantages to the issuer and companies like Tesla. And actually, it is a risk to the investor. So let's think about it from the investor's perspective. If you owned that 20-year, 5% Tesla bond that could be called in 15 years, you were receiving $50 a year in interest from that bond. And then it was called. You were expecting to get five more years of that $50 interest every single year, or I guess two $25 semi-annual payments. But once your bond is called, what happens is that the issuer pays you back whatever interest they owe to that point, and then they pay you your principal amount back. If interest rates have fallen across the board, and you're going to take your money and put it into another similar type of bond out there in the market, you're now going to get a 2% bond with a 2% interest rate, most likely. So you're switching from receiving 50 bucks a year to 20 bucks a year, and that's opportunity that you've now missed out on. Not technically money out of your pocket. I mean, you're not seeing red on your statements, but you're not making as much money as you were before. We call this reinvestment risk. Essentially, it's the risk that you receive interest or money from a called bond, and you reinvest that back into the market at a lower rate. And again, it's all about opportunity. Because a call feature is a risk for investors, you better believe that they will demand higher rates of return on those callable bonds. In terms that you'll probably see on the exam, it's important to know that callable bonds should come with higher rates of interest or higher yields than non-callable bonds, just because you're taking on more risk. A bond could also be puttable, which is actually very similar to a callable bond, Puttable bonds can be ended earlier than maturity, but the difference is that the investor decides when this occurs, not the issuer. So if you bought a Tesla puttable bond and wanted to end the investment earlier than expected and get your money back, a puttable bond would allow you to say, hey, I want my $1,000 back. I want the interest I'm due up to this point. I just want to move on to something else. Thank you, issuer. Thank you, Tesla. It was a pleasure, but see ya. Now, why would an investor, say someone like you, decide to put a bond back to the issuer? Well, first, you could just maybe want your money back. Whether you run into an emergency or go on a surprise vacation or need to buy an engagement ring, who cares what the reason is? If you just need your money back, hey, Puttable Bond will allow you to do that on the spot. But the other reason that we're about to talk about here is actually the most common reason why bonds are put back to the issuer. 
Investors most likely use put options when interest rates rise. For example, let's go back to that 20-year 5% Tesla bond that we've been discussing. If interest rates in the market were to rise to 8%, well, you've got your 5% Tesla bond, and we haven't talked about this in detail, but the interest rate of a bond that's created when the bond is originally sold never changes. So if you buy a 5% bond from Tesla, it's going to pay you 50 bucks a year every single year, no matter what happens in the market. Interest rates in the market might go up, they might go down, but that really affects new bonds that are being issued to the public for the first time. When you loan money to an organization, you decide on the interest rate up front, and that's not going to change over the life of the bond. So again, going back to our 5% bond, if you've got a 5% bond when interest rates have gone up to 8%, if it's puttable, get rid of the 5% bond, put it back to the issuer. You'll get your principal back and any interest you're due up to that point. And then take that money that you've received back, reinvest it back into the market, buy another similar type bond that you'll now get with an 8% interest rate or something close to that. Essentially, you could switch from a bond paying you 50 bucks a year to paying you 80 bucks a year if it has a put feature like that. And that is why investors decide typically to put their bonds when interest rates rise. Put options on bonds are advantageous to investors. So these bonds can be sold with lower rates of interest, or at least lower than average rates of interest, and still are marketable to the investing public. So if an issuer wants to save some money on interest, one thing they could do is create a puttable bond. There's another bond feature as well that would also allow the issuer to save money on interest. When a bond is convertible or when it has a conversion feature, the investor has the ability of converting that interest paying bond into shares of the same company's stock. Tesla is an example of a company that has actually sold convertible bonds in the past. And one of the main reasons why they sold the convertible bond the way they did is to save money on interest. Convertible bonds are good for investors because they give them another way to make money off of their investment. If the company's stock is rising in the stock market, it could easily create a great opportunity to convert the bond into shares of stock. Normally, when a convertible bond is originally sold, the conversion feature doesn't have much value. Let's go back to our example, our 20-year 5% Tesla bond. Instead, this time, let's say it's convertible into 10 shares of Tesla stock. If you bought that bond originally for $1,000, well, you bought a $1,000 Tesla bond that can be converted into 10 shares of stock. Let's assume that the stock price was $90 in the market. Well, 10 shares of stock worth $90 a piece would mean the conversion feature is worth $900. And if you just bought this bond for $1,000, turning it into $900 a stock really doesn't make a ton of sense. Conversion features usually need time to build value. And a lot of times we're just waiting for the stock price to rise. And if it does rise enough, then it could be worth something. For example, with the same bond, let's say the stock price rises to $150. Well, we have a bond that's convertible into 10 shares worth $150 in the market right now. Well, now that conversion feature is worth $1,500. And if you bought the bond originally for $1,000 and now can convert it into $1,500 worth of stock, that probably makes a lot of sense to convert the bond over to stock. Now, there's a lot more that goes into that decision. You're moving your money from an interest-paying investment where you're getting interest every six months from this Tesla bond into Tesla stock, which historically has never paid a dividend or never paid income. So you're essentially moving from one income-paying investment, that bond pays you interest every six months, to a stock that doesn't pay you income but can make a significant amount of money if it goes up in price. If you can sell the stock for a much higher price than what you bought the bond originally for, you can create a lot of what we call capital gains. Because of this potential to make money on the stock, convertible bonds are, of course, beneficial to investors, and therefore, they can be sold with lower interest rates than, say, a non-convertible bond. Calls, puts, and conversion features are all optional features on bonds, and they're not the only features that you could see on a bond. You'll certainly learn more and more about other features that are available out there, but in terms of the most tested features, those are probably your top three.
It's important to know each one, what it means to be callable, what it means to be puttable, what it means to have a conversion feature. And it's also important to understand how that factors into the risk of the bond, which ultimately will factor into the interest rate of the bond and how much the issuer has to pay to borrow money from its investors. The issuer, in combination with the underwriter, will decide what features the bond that they sell has. Again, those features will ultimately decide the cost of their borrowing money. Once the bond structure is finalized, the issuer essentially will hand over the bonds to the underwriter. The underwriter will then sell those bonds to the public. Again, Tesla hiring Morgan Stanley to sell their bonds. If the bond is marketable, then investors will purchase the bond, effectively lending money to the issuer. Once the bonds are sold to the market, the underwriter gets their cut and the majority of the money goes back to the issuer, being Tesla in our example. And from there, the issuer can use that money to build a new automobile factory, hire new workers to expand their business for whatever purpose. And over time, they will pay back those borrowed funds usually through semi-annual interest payments to its bondholders. And then at the very end, there'll be one final principal payment where everyone receives their par value back at maturity. Once the bond is sold in the market, then the bond trades amongst investors. The bond market is a whole other conversation and a whole different podcast and comes with a lot of characteristics and things you need to know for the different exams you're preparing for. Hopefully, this podcast helped you understand how bonds are structured and how they fundamentally work, which is the first step to understanding what a debt security actually is and how it works. There are a lot of different versions of bonds out there, everything from corporate bonds to municipal and U.S. government bonds. They have different characteristics, different features, uh, and it can get pretty complicated in terms of how these trade and the whole idea of what yield is on a bond. We will discuss those in future podcasts. But once you have a solid foundation for what a bond actually is, all those other items become much more easy to remember and much more easy to relate to the material. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast today. I really appreciate it. If you have any feedback, feel free to reach out to me. You can reach out to me directly through basicwisdom.net. And whether you're looking for tutoring services, general guidance on how to approach these exams, or just to say a quick hi, you can go to my website, click the contact button at the top right, and you can get in touch with me and even get my personal cell phone number uh, right there on the website. And finally, as a last reminder, if you're looking for an SIE program that is modern, smart, and will help you master the material that you need to know for the SIE exam, go to achievable.me. And you can check out a product that comes with all writing materials that I have put together on my behalf and behalf of my company, Basic Wisdom, in conjunction with Achievable and their smart learning system. It is the best program out there, and I know I'm biased, but I'd highly recommend you check it out. You can gain access to a free trial and get access to our first chapter of material without actually paying a dime. Check out the material and let us know what you think. Thanks so much for listening again. Good luck with your studies, and I'll see you next time.